Hello and welcome to this panel event. It's jointly hosted by the Chart Bank Institute, the ICAW here in Northwest and Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, I'm Stuart Finity. I'm one of today's speakers and I'll be hosting the event. Uh, so if you've not already gathered, the session is being recorded, but the great news is it'll be available in the next couple of days on the Charter Bankers YouTube channel. Uh, so what's going to happen today is Chris Mather and I will speak probably for the first sort of 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, then we're going to open up the discussion to the floor. So please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we may get to them sooner, but if not, we'll certainly get to them after we start our initial pitches. And today's session, we will be disciplined for time. So we will finish at or just before 2 p.m. to make everyone sure they get back to the next appointment. So first of all, why am I here? Uh, my title at the university is reader, which is a fancy way of saying I'm somewhere between lecturer and professor. Uh, but most of my career has been in frontline banking in areas such as commercial and business banking on the front line, actually dealing with lending uh, to businesses and uh, trying to track deposits in to balance liquidity issues that we're talking about later. Uh, while I was there, I continued taking qualifications uh, and becoming also a chartered banker. And that led me to five years ago, moving into Manchester Metropolitan to teach uh, banking and finance students. Uh, so before I carry on talking too much, I'm going to hand over to Chris to let me introduce yourself. Chris. Thanks very much, Stuart. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be talking to, with you today. Thank you for having me on and, and good afternoon, everyone listening. So I'm Chris Mather. I'm an associate partner at Deloitte based in London. Um, I lead our banking and capital markets external audit business um, for mid-size and high-growth firms, uh, and I'm a fellow of the ICAW. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Chris. Well, I'm, I'm going to start off. I'm, I'm conscious that we'll have uh, a mixed audience today with different levels of understanding. Uh, so I'm going to start off by explaining a few basic bits at the start. Uh, it won't be death by PowerPoint. I'm going to use one slide uh, just to establish what we're talking about. Uh, so uh, hopefully in a second or two, you should see uh, my screen appear. Uh, there you go. Uh, and um, if, if I show you a very, very simplified bank balance sheet. Uh, so the balance sheet uh, will introduce, first of all, uh, is some equity or capital in this case. So shareholder funds, we know that's on the balance sheet. Uh, we'll have some debt in the context of most banks. For now, I'll just define that as uh, savings uh, that uh, depositors are put into the bank. And uh, we'll have some assets like any other business. So for the moment, I'll define that uh, as loans and other assets that have been used. Uh, now, uh, if we were talking about capital and capital and liquidity are very closely related, one of the things that would be really important is the idea that we've got sufficient equity, sufficient shareholder money, so that if the value of the assets goes down, so our investments act poorly, then there's enough money that can be lost here so that it is the uh, shareholders that lose the money uh, and not the depositors. Uh, and we'll return back to that theme uh, as we go through. But let me add some more detail, first of all, um, to illuminate the discussion. Uh, so first of all, uh, within that debtor book, we, we've got a, a number of uh, savings, a lot of small uh, consumers, typically small amounts of savings, uh, to, certainly when you compare it to mortgages or lending to com commercial businesses. Uh, and that those funds are available to withdraw at any time. Um, but from a practical point of view, we assume that they tend to go and leave an institution relatively slowly. Uh, so there we go with a dotted line. Uh, and what I mean by that is if there's an issue with the bank, uh, these consumers typically used to have to queue up to go withdraw from the branch. But even if they're now doing it online, they're doing it in dribs and drabs. Small amounts of money is going out uh, so it doesn't rush out the door all at once. The next group I want to highlight in my simplified model uh, is business customers, and I've called the savings deposits there as interchangeable. Uh, and again, very similar to the small customers, those funds are typically repayable on demand. Uh, but unlike uh, small customers, as you get into bigger businesses, the chunks of cash start to become larger. And if these businesses decide to withdraw their funds, you can start to see larger amounts. So you can see there my arrow money going out is getting bigger. So liquidity risk is starting to get bigger uh, as the amounts of funds involved increase. Uh, and the final group uh, that I'll put there are institutional depositors. 
Um, I've included their money market funds, but for simplicity, uh, I've assumed big banks, pension funds, other people that sit there all day watching Bloomberg and other channels. Um, and typically, these are significant amounts of money on the similar terms uh, to the savers and depositors we discussed before, but because they are watching this uh, on a day-to-day -day moment, and because their sums are likely to be larger, uh, these individuals can withdraw substantial millions, potentially, amounts of funds uh, at a moment's notice. So the liquidity risk there is significantly higher. So that's the liquidity side. What's happening on the asset side? Well, on the asset side, uh, I'm going to assume that a bank has some cash or central bank reserves. In other words, uh, the bank's own account with the central bank. Uh, and that means that that money is immediately available uh, should depositors start to withdraw their funds. And in most times, what you're looking at is a situation uh, where funds are being withdrawn. Uh, they're being taken out on a regular basis, but new customers are paying back in uh, and those central bank reserves and the cash act as a buffer. So I've green lighted it um, so we can access that as cash. The next and a very significant uh, chunk of money there is government bonds. Uh, so this is where the bank has lent money to the government in the form of a bond. Uh, and because uh, it's lent to central banks uh, and to the government, uh, we assume that there is no risk there in that the UK government, the Federal Reserve has never defaulted. Uh, so from a risk point of view, that can be exchanged for cash relatively easily um, without uh, the, any large issues. However, there is a problem, which I'm going to flag at this point, uh, in that just because you can exchange it for cash doesn't mean you get for it what you would want. And um, bond prices can go up and down. And therefore, I've put my cut for haircut. So without getting to bond pricing, what I mean by that is if, if our bank here is invested in a lot of bonds uh, and um, well, again, my bonds have gone, let me put the bonds back. And just got my screen, uh, bond value can be fluctuate. Uh, if you've invested a lot of bonds at 1% and you've got a million pounds worth of bonds paying 1% there, you know that at the end of the term, you're going to get your money back because there is very, very little risk, probably no risk in that happening. However, if now the interest rate has gone up, as we've seen recently, and interest rates are 3 4 5 6%, then no one is going to take your bonds paying 1% for a million pounds when they can use their million pounds to get a much higher rate. The only way you can sell those is to lose money, uh, and therefore you have to take a haircut as uh, on there. The next chunk I'm going to advertise there is uh, mortgages, so secured loans. Again, you can exchange secured loans uh, with other institutions. Other institutions will buy a mortgage or the secured loan book. Um, so I'm going to make it as amber. Why amber? It's going to take some time to get that cash realized. And as you can imagine, at the times that these funds need to be released, you are probably going to have to sell that at a discount. So therefore, you're going to have to reduce the price uh, and therefore take a loss on your book in order to get the cash. And then there are lots of other things that make up uh, a typical bank's book. I'm going to highlight unsecured loans, quite difficult to price, really hard to exchange, uh, make liquid. And if you did or were able to do it, you're going to have to substantially reduce the price there. Um, now, why have I highlighted the cut in the price? Because even if you can get the cash, if you are selling these assets at a reduced amount, you are going to risk crystallizing a loss and therefore potentially give yourself a capital issue, i.e. you've lost money, potentially more than the shelves have got, and you start to put depositors' funds at risk. So I promise this wouldn't be death by PowerPoint, so I could take that off the screen. And I want to give you the basics there. I'm just going to say a very few words about social media before I hand over to Chris. Uh, and uh, the first part of it is that um, we, we've got a financial services compensation scheme in the IT kingdom. These deposit fund insurance means that for most businesses, uh, individual shareholders, uh, individual depositors, I should say, uh, they know that if a bank fails, they're going to get their money back up to 85,000 within the institution. And in the United States, the protection is substantially higher at $250,000. But however, that only covers 65% of uh, small uh, businesses and individual depositors funds. So a significant amount is at risk. And in terms of social media, um, if you think back to the film uh, Mary Poppins, uh, significantly before social media and obviously fictitious, there was a famous run on the bank over an argument over Tuppence. Um, well, that illustrates the run of the bank. 
So without social media, what happened? Uh, the panic that the bank was unable to pay back the tuppence spread, uh, the uh, caused fear, people started to panic and started to want to withdraw their cash and get in the queue first. So a potentially viable bank, and we don't know because it was made up, um, was uh, driven into potential insolvency. Northern Rock, back in the financial crisis, certainly in the era of social media just about, Twitter had been formed two years before. Uh, again, what you saw there is reports on the evening news about what was happening at the bank. Everyone will remember Robert Peston, then at the BBC, doing a very responsible job. But even though those messages were out there, the existence of queues, the fear, the concern, even when the Bank of England got involved, started to get this issue of contagion and more and more people went to take out their cash. And then Silicon Valley Bank, most recently. Uh, so a, a bank uh, with a substantial amount of those government bonds that would have had very, very little risk if they'd been held to term, needed to generate cash quite quickly and couldn't, so started to lose money, uh, therefore created to potential capital risk. Uh, and at that point, social media, WhatsApp groups with a very concentrated uh, group of individuals or depositors uh, caused a run on the bank. So what you've seen all the way through this is individuals coordinated and cooperating, not intentionally, but, but by a sort of herd mentality. Um, and even in the area of low technology, you store bank runs and technology starting to make that even more frequent. Now, I, I've stolen enough of the time there to establish the basics. I'm going to hand over to Chris now to take this one stage further. Chris. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, let me just share a, a few slides um, myself as well. So let me just do that. Hopefully you can all see those um, very well now. Um, so you know, Stuart's covered quite a lot of the basics around um, what a bank run is, but I just wanted to reiterate a, a few points. And, and firstly, is, is the one that banks rely on confidence. And I'm going to return to that theme. They, they rely on confidence. And you know, Stuart set out what a what fractional reserve banking is. That's uh, basically the, the, the balance sheet model um, that he showed. And the crucial thing is, is that there is not enough cash held that if all the customers decide to withdraw at the same time, there's not enough cash to go around. And therefore, um, if confidence is lost and, and certain customers start withdrawing, it's rational behavior for other customers to do the same because they know that there won't be enough cash um, without liquidating some of those assets that, that, that Stuart mentioned. Um, so it, confidence really is key. Um, now, if we have think a bit about how bank runs evolved, and Stuart mentioned that the Northern Rock example back in the global financial crisis, um, and in those days, while the, I'm sure the bank run would have seemed pretty quick to the the management and executives of Northern Rock, um, it is it is very slow compared to what happened in Silicon at Silicon Valley Bank back in March of this year. And what I wanted to do is just put up some numbers um, comparing um, the um, what happened at Washington Mutual, which was the biggest U.S. banking failure back in 2008, with Silicon Valley Bank in 2023. So in 2008. Um, when there was a bank run on, on Washington Mutual, um, customers withdrew 17 billions worth of deposits within a nine day period. And that was of just under 10% of total deposits. So 17 billion in, in nine days, sounds like a lot. But then you compare that to what happened with Silicon Valley Bank, where customers withdrew 40 billion in just a few hours. Now that is an incredible step change in the speed of withdrawal, and that you know, that's because you can now do this um, using a, using your app, using a banking app. You don't need to you know stand outside a branch and, and get in get in line. So the the technology has played a, a huge impact on that. But also, and if we skip through to the the next slide, um, social media also has played a role. Um, returning to the theme that the banks rely on confidence, um, social media can feed the panic. And it's not just information 
um, that, that might be factually accurate, misinformation can also cause panic. So you can see how if, the, if, if there is a potential or perceived problem with a bank, and then one of the particularly an influential depositor you know, posts that on Twitter or, or exchanges lots of WhatsApp messages with others, um, quickly that information is shared and panic starts and deposits start going out the door. Um, and you know, that really perpetuates the bank run. And there's already been some studies done on the, the relationship between social media and bank runs. Uh, in the US, there was a research paper by the National Bureau of Economic Research, um, which suggests a negative rise in, a rise in negative tweets about SVB before the collapse. Um, and that was followed by a drop in its stock price, which was seen as a proxy for deposits. And the authors concluded that social media did indeed contribute to the run on Silicon Bank. Our Silicon Valley Bank. The, the Financial Stability Board, that one of the global supervisors, has commissioned a report into this, and they are expecting to report later this year or, or, or next year. Um, and I think that just shows the, the degree of seriousness that, that regulators are taking on that. I did want to also point out, though, that traditional communication channels are still important, as well as, as, well as social media. So I'm talking here about press conferences, investor presentations, that type of thing. And one um, ex good example of that was, was Credit Suisse. Um, so a key investor in Credit Suisse was a Saudi National Bank. And they were, uh, and the chairman of Saudi National Bank was asked, um, and this was just a few um, weeks after the Silicon Valley Bank um, run, um, they were asked, would they make further funding available um, if Credit Suisse needed it? And they said, absolutely not. And that caused real panic around Credit Suisse. It clearly had a number of ongoing issues anyway, but that was the one of the triggers um, for a run on, on, on that bank. And ultimately, um, it, was, it had to be acquired by UBS at, at the behest of the Swiss regulator. So while social media is clearly very important, um, just to point out that the traditional methods are uh, traditional methods of communication are also really important as well. So we've thought a bit about um, how um, what a bank run is and how that can be perpetuated by social media. So the next question is, well, what can regulators and supervisors do about that? And what can banks themselves do about that to help mitigate this, this risk? And I'm going to start off with, with some of the regulatory challenges. Now, many of you will know that in the financial crisis, post the financial crisis, there was a lot of regulation around banking that was brought in, you know, the likes of Dodd-Frank uh, in, the, in the US. But in recent times, there's been a certain rowing back of certain elements of that really to promote growth. Um, and in, in, in the US, some of the, the banks that were not deemed systemically important were um, now exempted from some of the regulatory requirements in the UK. The regulator was thinking about um, the, the strong and simple um, regime and how things could be made more, regulation could be made proportional for some of the small, smaller banks in the market. But I think overall, regulators are now having second thoughts around whether whether that should be the direction of travel. And in, indeed, this is this is potentially a tipping point to increase regulation again. Um, now, I'm, I'm drawing on some of the thinking of Deloitte's um, Center for Regulatory Strategy here around what banks can do, or what, what regulators can can do, um, both in the short and, and medium term. Um, if I start with short-term measures, um, firstly, they can uh, regulators can be focused on on banks that are uh, have vulnerable liquidity profiles, such as concentrations of deposits above the deposit insurance threshold that that Stuart mentioned. And and you know, why that's important is, it, I guess, if you know that your 
um, deposit is, is 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 insured. So if the bank goes bust, you're not going to lose your money. You're not going to be in such a rush to withdraw um, and, and and therefore contribute to the bank run. So so that is that is potentially pretty key. Um, can you secondly can you pre can banks um, lending facilities be Prepositioned so that they can be used as collateral if they need to draw down from the central bank, and we saw a lot of that during the global financial crisis. But can there be sort of ongoing, potentially ongoing facilities, um, so it's not just a, a crisis measure? Um, can banks be challenged on how well they can manage intraday liquidity? Um, a lot of banks are very good at managing liquidity end of day, but if we remember the the um, what I said around the speed of the withdrawals from SVB, that happened in a number of hours. Um, so mon monitoring that liquidity intraday is, is crucial. Making sure that another measure is making sure that, that vulnerable banks have a high quality or have a, a good stock of high quality liquid assets. So basically assets that can be sold really quickly to get cash in. Um, and finally, um, banks um, might need to toughen their stress test. They, they really do stress, particularly from a liquidity perspective, um, so they can cope with all eventualities. And you'll, you'll notice that not, not a lot of these measures are specifically aimed at, at social media. And the reason for that is that you know, banks and regulators, they can't really control social media. And I, I will come to what banks can do a little bit about this. But, you know, of course, people can put out whatever they want on social media. So one of the really important things is to have a robust framework, particularly from a liquidity perspective, before any negative rumours start. So you can handle those sort of things. So that, that was the short term measures. If, if I think slightly longer term, what regulators can do, well, Firstly, um, potentially revisiting recovery plans um, and recovery plans are, 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 are what banks will have to have in place to help um, stabilize the situation if they get into trouble. Um, but can they can that be done quickly enough and should they be revisiting that to make sure that that really can happen? Um, secondly, examining business model sustainability. And I suspect this is going to be a big one that the regulators look at, because if we think about SVB, they had that portfolio of government bonds that were long-term. And as Stuart outlined well, when the, when the interest rates went up, the value of those bonds went down. And when they had to be sold to meet de demand from deposit holders, lot, significant losses were crystallized. And if those if if those um, assets had been hedged for interest rate risk, there wouldn't have necessarily been that sort of problem. So, regulators thinking through banks' business models, I suspect, will be a, a, a real a incoming feature. Um, next, around use of capital buffers, and and this goes down back to what I said around how regulation has sort of road back a bit in recent times. So there were a lot of, sort of talk about adding capital buffers, and that did happen post-financial crisis. But um, in recent times, supervisors have been saying, OK, well, maybe we don't need banks to hold this additional capital, which is what I'm referring to by a capital buffer. Um, so perhaps they, they're, they're not required. But now the thinking again is, well, actually, you know, we should be thinking about this and perhaps there should be greater capital buffers held by banks. So if they do get into trouble, um, they won't have a, a capital issue. And then finally, just really revisiting some of the liquidity um, standards, um, you know, is the thinking through is the current framework fit for purpose? So quite a, a range of measures that potentially regulators can take, but mostly focused on you know, are the banks in good shape to be able to withstand um, any 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 bank runs or negative publicity that that comes their way. Um, so if I then move to what banks themselves are thinking about, and you know, the there are various sort of stages of, um, you know, I guess, sophistication on some of these measures. And you know, the, the larger banks will, of course, be doing more than the, the, the smaller banks on this. Um, 
but clearly this risk of, of bank runs in a digital era is, is not going anywhere. So banks are going to have to start probably thinking about this. And I, this is definitely on the on board's radars. Um, and if we think about some of the overall preventative measures, and there's some overlap with what I mentioned around regulators, but, but firstly, can they, you know, if they think about their customer deposit base, should they be thinking about trying to take more sort of term deposits rather than instant access? So in a bank run, those, those deposits can't be withdrawn um, quite as quickly, um, which, is, which is clearly helpful. Um, secondly, profiling the level of deposits um, holders without deposit guarantee. So one of the issues with Silicon Valley Bank, they had a lot of wealthy individuals um, who'd made money from, from uh, um, tech in, in, in Silicon Valley. And they were all above the 250,000 US dollar um, guarantee limit, which meant that they were very panicky when, when rumors started flying around. Um, and and they, they they instantly well withdrew their cash and moved them to some of the larger institutions. So understanding that sort of level of um, deposit holders without above that deposit guarantee level is is, is key. Um, banks could consider holding further liquidity. There's a, it's quite often a trade off there with profits that can be made. So that's uh, one one that um, management are thinking about, and then business model sustainability, which I've, I think I've already talked about, but also the market's perception of that business model, because that's key. You may, you know, you may have, as a bank board, think you have a sound business model, but if others don't, they no longer have confidence in your in your bank. And very swiftly, as, as we've seen, that can turn the wrong way for the bank. Um, so it's, it's not just what you think, it's what others think as well. And then I've added a few measures sort of specifically to combat social media risk. Um, some obvious ones around um, early warning indicators. So some sort of social media monitoring, having a, people at the bank to do that. So if there are any, is there any negative sentiment around, um, can that be identified quickly and then dealt with? Um, secondly, identification of influential deposit holders. So, um, can you sort of almost profile some of those deposit holders that you have and look, are any of those deemed influencers on social media? And then if, if there are, can you target those with particular messages to help um, give a po more positive um, view of the bank, um, which helps sort of mitigate the risk? Thirdly, gen overall um, market communication particularly around social media. So I think in the past, banks have really thought of social media as a potential marketing tool, not a risk management tool. Um, so, but now they're, they're realizing that perhaps they can use that to get the message out they want from a risk management perspective as well. Um, fourthly, around banks' traditional risk frameworks probably don't have social media risk in there. And that's something that's been changing in recent times, probably a bit before um, the S SVB, actually. But it's something that is increasingly being looked at as a result of SVB. And finally, thinking about customer complaints, particularly those on social media and being able to deal with those quickly, um, because what you don't want is a customer kicking up a fuss on social media and creating negative sentiment about the bank that you then could potentially cause panic. So that, that's that's um, the end of, of what I wanted to say. So Stuart, I think we have some Q&A now, is that right? We, we do indeed. Uh, brilliant. Thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, just a reminder, if you want to add a question, pop it in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we, we have had some questions come in advance, so I'll, I'll ask some of those, uh, but feel free to ask further questions. I'll be delighted to address those. Uh, what, what, one interesting question that, that's come in in response, um, I guess you're talking about increasing the liquidity of assets and making all those changes you've recommended, uh, Chris, it is in the current economic context, what is the impact there? Because we're facing some quite challenging economic conditions and new data out today. Yes, yes. The uh, inflation not dropping quite as well, not dropping at all, actually, which was a bit of a 
bit of a surprise. And I guess I, I returned yet again to um, banks rely on confidence. And with negative sentiment around in the current economic conditions, that does increase the risk of, of further bank runs. And I suppose if I sort of pinpoint a few um, particular areas, just to go into that in a bit more detail. So we've seen how the rising interest rates to combat inflation, that can challenge banks' business models because we've been in such a benign environment for so long. I think a lot of um, people have forgotten that um, we are uh, previously we were well below the, the 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 usual interest rates, and that hadn't necessarily been taken into account in banks' business models. So that that's one area that that's been revisited. And then rising interest rates can also mean that people can't pay back their loans, and therefore banks are going to be taking higher loan provisions which again erodes the capital of the bank. Um, and then uh, thirdly, I suppose if people are, you know, are in the high inflation world, they feel like they don't have as much money in their pocket, they're going to be particularly sensitive if they think they're going to lose money as a result of a bank going down and would be even, it would be even quicker to, to remove money. So there are, there are a few things there that, that, that point to in a current economic environment, it is more likely that there would be a, a bank run because of that loss of confidence. Now, there are one or two things that go the other way. And I would just the, the one I would point out is around the ability of a bank to make money. So in a higher interest rate environment, um, banks can charge more on loans um, and they, they can make what's known as a higher net interest margin because they can you know, the, the, the amount they can increase the what they charge on loans is up, is higher than the uh, the increase in what they are giving out to deposit holders. So they can make a higher net interest margin, which means that means they make higher profits absent absent loan provisions, which I mentioned. Therefore, th those profits can be used to boost the capital of the bank. Um, and put them in a, a more sound position. Um, so that's a bit of a long-winded answer, Stuart, but uh, hopefully that, that answers the question. Yeah, I, I, I like that. And actually, the, the issue of net interest margin, uh, which, which sounds very theoretical and the sort of things that uh, senior bankers and academics discuss, we, we can see that in the press straight away with the argument that banks haven't put the saving rates up as quick as they have um, at loan rates. Um, it's also, I think, going to be very bank specific here, uh, depending on vulnerabilities. So, so the issues that Silicon Valley Bank had would have been even more exacerbated at this point as rates have continued to rise. Uh, and certainly in the UK, it looks like rates are on an increasing upward trend. Um, I, I think the, the only other thing I'd add to what you said, Chris, because I agree with everything, is also the unwinding of the quantitative easing, sort of pulling money out of the system. That's inevitably meaning that there's less liquid cash sloshing around the system, or, or and it's becoming more expensive to have those assets that you said were really important. Uh, that that's also working against the banks. So potentially in, in a situation where banks or certain banks are going to become more vulnerable, uh, and some banks are going to profit and do very well at the increased margins, I'm guessing. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Uh, well, one of the, picking up on one of the points that you mentioned about the the um, desire for more high quality liquid assets, and you talked about more capital, and I guess quite often those will overlap. Um, do you see challenges or, or a negative impact on society if banks are raising the, the number of quality assets? Um, well, I suppose. It, it, do you mean in the way that if they in, invest in more high quality assets, then it will be harder? What, what the, the, there's less there's less going around for society as a whole, or or the fact that um, they will then not be able to because it, because they're investing in those assets, that means there is less funding in the economy as a whole, so they can't then. Um, you know, funds SMEs, for example, is, is, is that the angle you're, you're getting at, Stuart? Huh? Uh, you can take whatever angle you want, but those points made an awful lot of sense, yeah. Yeah, they, well, maybe I'll take the second one. So, yeah, I, I mean, I guess if, 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 if banks are investing in these high-quality assets and not lending out the money to the, the broader economy, then, yeah, I think that does raise questions um, of, uh, and it potentially reduces the the funding to the economy as a whole and you know that was actually one of the reasons that regulators wanted to 
to row back on some of the regulations that came in in the financial crisis because they wanted they wanted growth and you know, one of the ways to get growth is making sure that there is good investment uh, or good funding from banks to enable um enable investment and enable productivity um so if banks are not lending out to um potentially valid businesses or longer term projects then that clearly does have ramifications for society as a whole Perfect. Thank you for that. And we, we, we've got some questions I think, inspired by, by some of the comments you made, because you, you mentioned misinformation uh, and the impact that can have. Uh, and we've got a question on the Q&A box. Uh, do you see social media being supervised by regulated days to come? Uh, do you see any role with information and broadcasting ministry in the UK who sets do's and don'ts for social media? Uh, there's more informa misinformation than correct info at the moment. Well, I, I'll, I'll start that while you get your thoughts together, Chris. Um, I, I, we've seen debates around this um, outside the context of banking, um, the issue of misinformation in multiple ways, the, the impact it's having on individuals and the self-esteem. Um, and it's proven incredibly hard to regulate. We, we've already seen the suggestion that WhatsApp might be accessible uh, to security services and the pushback that they've paid. Uh, the, the idea that um, the, the cost of regulating this um, by uh, social media platforms that argue that they are not um, publishers in the conventional sense, like a newspaper would, uh, but a platform and a channel. Um, we, we've also got the issue of the fact that a lot of this is internationally held uh, and not based in any one jurisdiction. Um, so that, 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 that my initial thought, I, I think that it, ideally, yes, um, I, I think it'd be incredibly tough to achieve. I don't know what your view is, Chris. Yeah, I, I think exactly the same thing, Stuart. I mean, this is clearly much broader than than just a debate over banking. It, 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 there are a number of um, you know, very um, you know, difficult issues here, but to actually be able to to regulate what is done on social media, I just I'm not really sure how that can be done in practice. Um, the, there's a lot of you know, the, the freedom of speech agenda and, and the right to privacy are you know, two of the, the reasons why people wouldn't wouldn't necessarily want that. Um, but even if, if it was agreed that that is something that should be done, it would be very, very difficult to do that in practice. So um, I, I don't see it happening anytime soon, is my view. Yeah, and, and, and I guess you, you, you touched on this a little bit with your comments around banks being proactive in combating misinformation and having um, sort of that 24-7 awareness, less from a marketing point of view and more a response to this, um, which puts reputational risks that we talked around for years in, in a brand new context. Um, I, I, I've got another question here also uh, touching on some of the, um, uh, the questions you've asked. Uh, Paul Rabies uh, messaged, uh, as most bank runs are based on perceived risk rather than actual risk, uh, what is the danger and increase in the financial services compensation scheme limits to reduce this perceived risk? Uh, I don't know if you want to take that first, Chris. Yeah, I mean, so that, that has certainly been one of the measures mooted in, in increasing deposit um, guarantees. And then in the UK, that is the, the FSCS. Um, it... I suppose it increases the the potential um, government bailouts. Now, actually, a lot of the the FSCS is is funded by contributions from the the banks rather than the, the government itself. Um, but it does it does raise questions around you know should people be taking sort of responsibility for for, for where they put the money themselves rather than necessarily having having everything insured. Um, Stuart, did anything to to add to that? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I reflected if, if this was a charter banker exam, uh, we, we'd want him to talk about moral risk, and moral hazard, um, because the 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 benefits are are, are are the the risks are being taken on by somebody else, um, and I think that that would be an argument. I have to say, I, I, I'm uh, myself. I think the benefits of increasing the limit um, to, to to mitigate the speed at which runs happen. Uh, has been uh, more beneficial than, than the downsides uh, and the risk of moral hazard. Uh, Paul can free to to come back on that if, if he wants. I, I think I think the the other thing, which frankly, if if I was a business based in Silicon Valley or anywhere else, and I was concerned my bank was failing, 
Um, I'd have two concerns. One, am I insured? Am I going to get my money back? Um, but also the issue about how long that's going to take. Because um, if, if you look at the financial services compensation scheme uh, page now, they say approximately seven days, unless it's very complicated. Um, but a business, if it's got to meet obligations in that time, that, that can be pretty severe. Um, so so um, I think increasing the limit, but also increasing the method by which uh, businesses can continue to operate, I think it'd be really, really important with that. Yeah, and I think the timing point's a good one, actually, because it's sort of not a, in the UK, it's not a funded scheme. And, that, and that's why it takes the, the sort of the 10 day um, window that, that you mentioned, or seven to 10 day window. In the US, it's a higher amount. It's 250,000 US dollars. And actually, you, it, 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 because it is, I think it is funded, then um, deposit holders can get their hands on the money much, much quicker. Um, so there may be something that, that can be done there. Um, even the US, I think they're talking about potentially moving moving up that number. So it wouldn't surprise me at all to see um, a, a movement upwards in the UK because it has been 85 um, for quite some time now. Uh, we, we've had a, another question picking up on, on another subject, uh, suggesting are uh, neobanks or new age specialist banks not more prone to social media risk than traditional banks uh, with bricks and mortar models have who have stable and loyal customer base? And in case of the newer banks, customers never meet the bank efficient, so there's no personal level of relationship between the bank and customer. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll pick that up a little bit because it, it's something that I, I bemoan, the, the, the uh, reduction in relationship management in, in banks, uh, because I think there's huge advantages to that. Um, I, I have to say, I, I think it's an issue even with the bigger banks. Um, certainly having worked in a major bank and gone out uh, trying to court more deposits um, to, to balance the liquidity um, model. Um, if, if you're going out encouraging large deposits, offering attractive rates, bringing that in to try and balance you, you tend to find that you end up with an awful lot of hot money that as soon as somebody else offers a higher rate uh, or as soon as there's another sort of risk, you don't get that stickiness um, that you describe um, with traditional banking. Um, I, I also think that the, certainly if you are looking at substantial amounts of deposits held by commercial organisations, um, the good ones will be reviewing the risks and reviewing the model, um, and it's probably more flighty and uh, more prone to change than it would have been in the past. And I'm saying this, ha having, having been a relationship manager for some major entities during the financial crisis, um, at that point, um, a lot of major organisations didn't move their money out of the institution I was working at, which was uh, caught in the financial crisis. Um, but I think the person is right. I, I, I think not only newer banks, but I think existing banks, uh, there is less um, stickiness. Uh, this is my bank, I'm going to stay with it, I'm more likely to move in general. And I probably waffled around that a little bit, Chris, so I'll hand over to you for a more erudite answer. <laughs> no, I think that was all entirely valid, Stuart. I mean, the one point I would add is I think that traditional banks um, tend to have greater diversification of deposit holders than some of the, the new banks that are perhaps um, more specialised in the in the industry or sector that they're in. So SVB being a good example, very focused on the tech sector and in California. Um and uh, yeah, th th therefore, they are more prone to that sort of act in one and, and, and flow out of the door uh, at the same time. If you have a, a, num a more diversified deposit base, I think that helps. Um, doesn't mean that you, you, they, they're not all going to withdraw their money, but it, th there are different influences on each of those, which uh, can mean that the, perhaps the, the withdrawal speed is not quite as quick. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, and, and we, we, we've had uh, another question come in suggesting that one potential thing you do is to try and slow down the speed of deposits. So maybe put some sort of restriction on the amount of funds that can be withdrawn uh, at once um, to, to try and limit it on the other side. What, what's your view on that, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it feels a bit like... Um... Yeah, it's, it's supermarkets when you know when the, you can only buy a, a certain amount of items, um, and uh, and um, during COVID because you were sort of rationed on, on 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 what you could get, and it's kind of the same idea for for banking here. You you know you're you're almost rationed on the amount of your own cash that you can take out um, to make it hopefully I suppose more more orderly. 
Um, it's not something that I've, I've ever seen a regulator talk about because I think, you know, if if you if if you were a, a deposit holder and you and you potentially were not going to be able to withdraw all your money because you knew that this rationing could come into place, then actually that could cause panic in itself. So I think you'd have to be pretty careful how you how you would implement that. Yeah, I, I, I entirely agree. And it actually links, uh, but Paul Rabies come back, I think probably linked to our early discussion about sending out messages and the messages triggering a bank run. Um, and we saw that with Northern Rock, the Bank of England announced it was standing behind Northern Rock and that, that was intended to calm people and it sent a negative message. Uh, I, I think raising the compensation scheme in a knee-jerk way would have the same issue um, and also limiting the funds because, again, I think if if you're worried that if banks suddenly become into difficulty that you can't get your money out, then the the pressure is actually I'll go I'll go earlier and I'll go quicker uh, and let's go now and that sounds like something that could precipitate an, an even faster run as you're going through. Um, we, we've had a question on the uh, the chat, uh, which is entirely fine uh, from Heather. Um, is a correlation between reputation or public image of a bank run on social media? So let me try it again because I'm reading that behind something. Is a correlation between the reputation or public perception of a bank on social media platforms and its vulnerability to bank runs? Uh, so I, I'll start while Chris gets his ideas. Um, I, I'm not aware of research that's directly looked at that. Um, uh, Chris earlier cited a really interesting paper that I'd researched um, whether uh, social media triggered the bank run uh, in Silicon Valley Bank or, or whether it just reflected it. Uh, and I'll post actually a link to that research in the chat box in a moment or two because I think it's really interesting. What, what they found is that social media amplified um, uh, uh, and caused uh, more of the run rather than just reflecting it. So, so certainly there's an issue there. So certainly in a crisis situation, if there's lots of issues going on, on social media, on Twitter, that could certainly precipitate and cause a run but on the basis of that research. Um, have you seen anything specifically on this, Chris? No, I, I haven't. I think it would be an interesting one to do some research on, to be honest. But uh, I don't think there's sort of any any evidence, uh, apart from anecdotal, um, that, that that we've seen at the moment. But uh, an, an, an interesting one to, for, for someone to look into, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I will post a link to that in a second or two because I can't multitask. Um, another question has come here about sh should we allow banks to fail, um, which, which is a, a question we've had in multiple situations many times. Uh, and uh, the, the, the balance for me comes down to w which causes the least uh, amount of harm. Um, the, the, the argument we touched on earlier about moral hazard around if you save banks that are in one way or another in difficulty, um, you don't punish them, um, and by punish them, I mean punish their shareholders uh, and investors for, for investing in a poor bank, and you encourage excessive risk-taking, um, as against the risks of causing the banks to fail, which is that um, you, you can cause contagion, and the idea that if, if a bank in one place in the world can fail, then why not mine? Um, and you start getting that concern that can you have a, a run on one bank can trigger uh, further things around the world. Uh, and in the scheme of things, we've mentioned the word Silicon Valley Bank quite a few times. We've talked about Northern Rock in themselves, relatively small banks. Um, but the concern at the time was that these things could trigger further issues. Um, I, I'd also add that as we add more regulation or, as Paul Rabe suggested before, uh, greater limits on, on insurance protection, the, the, the quid pro pro for that is that you have more regulation, which can also have its risks. Um, Chris, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, I mean, that's a topic that you could have a whole seminar on in it, in itself, I think. But um, I suppose one of the, the things that came in post-financial crisis was the concept of recovery and resolution plans in the, in the UK, um, particularly, I suppose, resolution, if, if we're thinking about bank failure. And the idea is almost that you, you, can, you can wind up a bank in an orderly manner. And I suppose when that came to the the test, and maybe well, I suppose there weren't any UK banks that that went under this time, but um, similar type of of regulation in the US. That well, it, it didn't quite stand up because actually um, regulators had to to step in um, in 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 quite a few instances. Um, so that that is one of the 
um, the challenges. The, the other point, I think, is the fact that banks try and do a, a few different things. So they are commercial enterprises um, and are meant to be acting in the interests of their shareholders, that making profits to, 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 for the shareholders, but also they are public utilities where people will put their money and you know, think, it will, think it will be safe. And if, if you are letting a, a, a public or a utility um, go down, that is clearly a, a, a huge issue. So, you know, I, I, I suspect at some point there will be a more fulsome debate around the actual how how banks work and what they are meant to be to everyone. And you know, that, again, that's probably a, a, a larger question for another day. But uh, I think that that plays into whether you should let banks fail or not. Wonderful. And maybe a topic we'll get you back on later on. Uh, I've got a a few questions that have come in directly. Uh, Anthony Boyd's put one in. Uh, Anthony, just type, uh, well, we answer a different question, pop a bit more details on those to to exactly what you mean. uh, And I'll come back to it if that's okay. Um, But there's a question here uh, about, uh, you know, and again, quite a controversial question. Given the risks here, uh, do banks actually offer uh, social benefits? Um, which I suspect is a reference back to was it Adair Turner uh, back in the financial crisis. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll pick that up initially. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I think w- one of the issues around liquidity that we're seeing here is a consequence of, of banks, frankly, in my view, doing something absolutely wonderful. Um, and you know, we, we, we call it intermediation, but this is taking money that uh, I want to deposit as an individual. I, I want to get access to. I'm going to put small amounts of money into the bank and frankly I don't want to take any risk and somehow that money is transformed into large chunks of money that can be lent to uh, businesses to invest or for people to buy a mortgage over 25 years um, and maybe there's a little bit of risk and the risk is taken out before it's good depositors so I think that social benefit that banks do is frankly amazingly wonderful um, but however it comes with a risk if banks don't quite, quite get the equation right and they tie up too much of the funds in assets that are not as liquid, it means that if a significant proportion of their depositors uh, try and get their cash out at once, uh, the bank isn't able to do so. So I, I actually think banks do an amazing job, and this is a huge benefit to society overall, but there are risks where it goes wrong. Um, Chris, I don't know what you think. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree. They they do offer, offer that benefit to society, um, but there is that... It goes back to what I said before, because there is the they are commercial enterprises um, looking to make profits um, for for shareholders. And um, there is that um, incentive to push up the risk curve in what they're doing. And it's important to make sure that uh, those risks are mitigated, whether it be hedging or, or other means. Um, to be able to do that. Because if we think about the example, again, at at Silicon Valley Bank, if that portfolio of bonds had been hedged for interest rate risk, they wouldn't have had the problem. And actually, they probably wouldn't have had the the fears over the business model, which was ultimately what led to the panic and and then the the, the bank run happening. So making sure that you have that sort of sustainable business model, I think is part of offering that, that social that social benefit. Wonderful. Now, Anthony's not not coming back. But I'll, I'll think I'll try and interpret what Anthony. So Anthony's putting this question here: How can regulators be held responsible um, for direction of duties when this is confirmed? Um, I, I guess there's there's two aspects here. You know, how should directors be held responsible, uh, and should be uh, regulators be? Oh, Anthony's come back. Perfect. Uh, times when regulators have failed to act. Um, uh, when red flags are evident, uh, should or can regulators be held to any level of making events? Um, so, 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 so the, the should question, uh, if I start with that, it is a tough one because you actually have to identify a particular decision or set of decisions or negligence in making decisions uh, that didn't happen. Um, and we've got a situation where we largely, in the regulation, I respond to the crisis that we had last time. So nobody necessarily anticipates what issues are coming around the corner. Uh, it's very easy for me sort of sat as an academic to use these case studies um, and to talk around it being obvious, uh, but it's not necessarily obvious when you're there. So I think that's really challenging. Um, I, I think if, if a regulator um, acts evidently in a way that, that is no agent, that, then I think there should be some consequence. And the same for directors. Uh, and we do have um, 
uh, senior manager regimes uh, in finance to pick up um, financial in individuals, uh, but regulators have never really been in the in the firing line. Uh, so that I've picked up. Chris, what's your view? Yeah, I, I think that's that's right. I don't think that there has been too um, much action that has been taken against regulators in in the past. I mean, I think again, if we we look at the the recent examples um, of banking failures in the U.S., you know, regulators have pretty much acknowledged that they were. I think maybe asleep at the wheel may be a little harsh, but they weren't as focused as they should be. And there, you know, there, there have been some there has been some good reasons for that, including. You know, were they adequately resourced to be able to regulate banks properly and you know, to, to be able to take action against them if they weren't properly resourced? Well, you think, OK, whose fault is that? Is that the, the government? Is that the some other agency that is responsible for it? So I think you have to be a little careful before you necessarily sort of take action against individuals, because there can be some some greater causes. But clearly, um, there should be some some consequences of of, of poor performance, um, and uh, particularly given the the implications for um, society at large. So it just needs to be done in the right way. Really, thank you, uh, and. Uh, good question here about, uh, in fact, potentially quite a big question. So I think looking at the time, we'll need to be brief. Uh, how do central banks intervene during a bank run to stabilise the financial system? Um, so I'll, I'll make a, a few very quick points. Um, I, I think the, the, the traditional one is to, to make sure that the bank has got access to liquidity. Certainly, if you've got a very, very stable bank with good quality assets, then actually providing a mechanism uh, as a lender of last resort where you can do that, I think is really important. Um, I, I think in terms of future developments, um, finding a way that the bank continue, be taken over by another institution, as we've seen, have a living will, do something that's likely to continue, I think will lessen the pressure for individuals to panic and need to withdraw their funds, uh, which is a key area. Uh, Chris? Yeah, I don't, I don't really have too much to, to, to add to that. I think that at a high level, uh, that, that is the, that's how they do things. So, you know, they clearly play a, a key role as the lender of last resort. Wonderful. Uh, and uh, quite a nice uh, place uh, to finish on, I, I think, there, because we're, we're coming up uh, to the hour. Um, I want to thank you, everyone, for attending. Some really interesting questions uh, that sparked uh, a debate, something I, I found interesting. Uh, Chris, uh, I really appreciate you giving you time. I know you've got huge experience at the front end dealing with this bank, so thank you very much for, for your time. Uh, and a, a big thank you to, to the partners, so to the Charter Banker Institute, which are one of the partners, and actually provide all the technical support to do this, uh, ICAW uh, in the Northwest, and my colleagues at Manchester Metropolitan University. I hope you found that useful. Uh, the will video will be up on the YouTube channel in the next few days. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. So uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.